Hello, it's good to link you up with stories in Ghana and around the world on News 360. Welcome to the program. My name is Issa Moni. And I'm Natalie Force. Let's take a look at the headlines for this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... An easy calm at Yilokrobo district of the eastern region over alleged irregularities in electricity billing system. Also, government targets of producing one million tons of cocoa pots under threat following pollution of river bodies used in irrigating cocoa farms. Also in the bulletin this evening, more than 30 houses at the verge of collapse at Echima Imponya district of the Ashanti region following massive erosion caused by rains. Farmers in the northern region reject government's claim of defeating for armyworm invasion in their country. And on the international front, unidentified gunmen attack rural home of Kenya's deputy president, William Ruto, near, west, near the western city of Eldoret. We've got the details of these stories for you plus the very latest from the world of sports and entertainment here on News 360. You're streaming live on 3news.com, so stay with us. And now there is an easy calm in the Yilokrobo district of the eastern region over alleged irregularities in electricity billing system. Now residents have kicked against a move by the traditional council to allow ECG to commence work if their bills are not withdrawn. The impasse between the people and ECG led to the burning down of the Somanya police station in May this year. Workers stationed at Yulokrobo ECG have resumed work, but they still feel unsafe operating in the area. The two parties, the Yulokrobo Traditional Council and management of ECG, met to find lasting solution to the problem to enable ECG resume operations. A memorandum of understanding was signed in setting the deal. After that meeting, the youth and some residents of the town also kicked against the move. They said overbilling must be investigated or possibly a cancellation of all outstanding bills in the community since that was what caused the confusion. And then we are here, there's a peace pipe. There's no there's peace pipe. The pipe is leaking. So you see, you be very careful to enter Krobo Town. No, they should hold on for the meantime. If not, we are taking the case to court. But the traditional council and elders also disagrees. You are alleging that you have been overbilled. An avenue has been created for you now to go there with your bill to demonstrate to ECG that you have been overbilled. For ECG to tell you that you have not been overbilled. This is the opportunity. So the issue they raised has been addressed. That notwithstanding, ECG says the prolonged issues will affect the company's output. We are putting an elaborate plan and measure just to address that. We've been working all, all this time over the past two months, interrogating the bills and making sure that their integrity is good. Owing to the situation, the police have beefed up security to ensure safety. The police were here to protect everybody, not even the easy workers alone, but everybody, every worker in the swimming you know, they are being protected by the police. So we are shown that they should go about their duties and report any threat to their lives to police and go to the aid very fast. On May 26 this year, irate youth of Yulokrobo attacked ECG staff in the district and vandalized property in protest against what they allege as overbilling of electricity in the area. 
A metal bridge that serves as the only route linking school children from Eija and Wewesu has now turned into a death trap due to its rusty condition. The school children fear being injured whenever they use the bridge. They're pleading with authorities to repair the partially collapsed bridge to avoid any casualties. The bridge, which is mainly used by residents of Kenton Krono and students of the Wewesu, M.A. Primary and Junior High School is posing a serious threat to lives. Some parts of the bridge have completely rusted and other parts broken down, making users vulnerable. Users of the bridge say several appeals have been extended to the authorities to reconstruct the bridge, but to no avail. The current state of the bridge is weak and can easily collapse at any time to endanger the lives of users. The collapse of the bridge will also cut Wereso from adjoining communities and students from other communities who school at Wereso. The headmaster of Wereso MA Primary and Junior High School, Bafo Asamwa, said the primary pupils frequently get injured using the bridge. When it rains, the river overflows, so the children were not able to come to school. Yeah, others who will come will have to pass through the roadside. And which is very dangerous. Some of the pupils also share their frustration on the deplorable state of the bridge. Some of the arm robbers, when you come, they will be under this bridge, so they, they will push one leg and the person will get injured. We are so scared from passing on it. A concerned parent, Kojo Yeboa, said the scary state of the bridge makes him want to withdraw his words from the school. It's very dangerous. I didn't know that this is what my children have been always passing on. If not, I could have even changed their school for a very long time. They appeal with authorities to urgently construct a new bridge for them. Now, erosion is threatening the livelihoods of people at Kotokuom, a farming community in the Atrima Mponia district of the Shanti region. The onset of the rains has worsened the plight of residents who are being displaced as a number of houses are on the verge of collapse, a report by Ibrahim Abubakar. A visit to Kotokom by the news team revealed an ugly spectacle of how erosion is displacing inhabitants. Many houses are collapsing in the low-lying town, leaving inhabitants in an uncomfortable situation. Some people have already deserted the Kotokom old town for more suitable settlements. The sloppy nature of Kotokom landscape just below the Achiman Ponya range makes the town highly prone to erosion. Running water cuts through homes any time it rains, leaving foundation houses almost hanging mid-air. Some of the houses have become death traps. These buildings, though not originally designed story buildings, now enjoy the status bestowed by erosion. The current situation, according to the residents, is life-threatening. They want assistance from the government to fight the erosion. Many people run from their houses to seek solace elsewhere whenever it rains because the wind shakes the buildings. When it rains, it is such a pathetic sight. We don't have any help from anywhere. The residents fear of a looming disaster if immediate steps are not taken to curb the devastating Hiroshima. Still in the Ashanti region, the Kotokum Health Center, which serves Kotokum Home communities and six other communities does not have a laboratory to serve patients. Health officials are appealing to authorities to provide them with a laboratory to enhance healthcare delivery and also save patients from needless referrals. The center attends to an average of 200 patients on a weekly basis from Kotokum and the other six neighboring communities. The establishment of the facility in 2008 was to bring healthcare delivery closer to the doorsteps of residents. With no medical doctor and only one midwife, the facility is under-resourced despite its achievement of zero maternal mortality for the past eight years. 
Unfortunately, the non-availability of a laboratory is affecting the quality of healthcare delivery. This, according to health officials, has led to frequent transfer of patients to the Nkaria Government Hospital, which is about 35 kilometers away from Kotokum. Transferring patients is also a challenge due to the lack of vehicles and poor road network. Access to portable water also becomes a Herculean tax whenever the facility's borehole breaks down. The health officials want their borehole to be mechanized for easy access. Well, maybe we're going to get a doctor in that part of the country soon because the youth of Kutukum who migrated to urban center to seek job opportunities have started returning home following the provision of electricity in the community. They claim access to electricity in the area has led to the creation of multiplicity of jobs and improvement in their living conditions. Ibrahim Abubakar filed the report. As a major intervention in bridging the rural urban development gap, the Rural Electrification and Self-Help Electricity Projects were introduced by the government of Ghana. Thousands of rural communities have so far benefited from the project to improve the economic condition of residents by providing them with alternative jobs apart from farming. Kotokum, in the Ashanti region, is one of such communities which benefited from the Rural Electrification Project in 2013. 24-year-old Emmanuel Sapon, who migrated to Kumase for apprenticeship in Babrin, is back to his hometown to start his own business after five years. I have benefited from the electricity in this community. I serve about 14 clients in a day. 19-year-old Isaac Osei is also a cold store operator. He commended the extension of electricity to the community, but pleaded for stable power. We are really benefiting from the electricity, but we are pleading for a more stable power supply because it's affecting our jobs. Access to electricity in Kutukum has made it possible for the community to mechanize some of their boreholes for easy access to water. 52-year-old Kwabna Mankwa appealed to the government to extend electricity in all rural communities to reduce rural urban migration. Let's now attention to agriculture now as river bodies used for irrigating seed gardens by cocoa board in the Bonsu de Cocoa station in the eastern region have been polluted by galamsey activities. This has consequently affected production, reducing annual yield from between 700 to 800,000 pods to 450,000 pods, a threat to the 1 million tons projection by the government. The Bonsu Cocoa station is under the new Jabin Cocoa district in the eastern region. It has four of the 27 seed gardens across the country. The four sites of seed gardens covering 49.86 hectares of cocoa farms are irrigated with the Brim River, which has been heavily polluted. It has affected our production. We were able to produce 700 and 800,000 a year. And uh, besides the outbreak of the solin shoe disease, if the we have the uh, irrigation facility in place, which will produce more than what we are having now. Experts say this has negatively affected the hand pollination exercise, which is now done only during rainy seasons, putting on hold minor season pollination. Some of the farmers need the pulse in May, June to plant a stick. That's why the management decided that we should have a, a way to help the farmers. They came with the idea for the construction of irrigation facility here. So uh, if it had not been the Galamsey activities, we wouldn't have any much problem with the pulse production throughout the year. The artificial hand pollination is aimed at increasing cocoa yields in the country due to the depletion of natural pollinators resulting in reduction in cocoa yields. It involves the picking of pollen from male cocoa flowers and dropping it on the stigma for cross-fertilization. A cocoa tree produces 1,000 flowers every season, yet only 5% of the flowers grow into pots.
Through artificial pollination, a hectare yield of the crop could hit two tons from the current average of 400 kilograms the farmers are getting. It is also providing jobs for the people, especially women. It has helped me so much. Uh, I, I use this work to cater for my children, further the education, and I have even a house in, from the work. It is expedient for the government to, as a matter of agency, find alternative irrigation systems to help sustain the farms if the one million ton annual target is to be achieved. Meanwhile, experts have cited poor agronomic practices as the cause of Ghana's dwindling cocoa production. They are, however, optimistic government's one million tons production target is achievable if farmers have access to improved hybrid seedlings and adhere to best practices. Catherine Frimpoma reports. Cocoa production in Ghana has fluctuated over the years. Ghana achieved its historic peak production of one million metric tons during the 2010-2011 season. Production, however, declined to 900,000 metric tons in subsequent years, producing a little over 700,000 metric tons in 2014-2015, the lowest in the last decade. Ohene Buafo is a cocoa farmer at Ataniata in the West Achim municipality of the eastern region. He owns large acreage of cocoa farms. Having done this for decades, Ohine Buafo is elated at his yield this season. The hybrid type is faster because it takes about two to three years to bear fruit, unlike the Tekwashi one. The Tekwashi one takes even five to eight years. And the hybrid seedling is always, some of the pots are on the tree. So it is very good than the Tekwashi pots. From two bags per hectare yield years ago, Ohene Buafo now boosts of eight bags per hectare. This he attributes to the improved hybrid cocoa seedlings coupled with sound agronomic practices he adopted upon the advice of experts. Cocoa Life has given it a lot of education through the cocoa extension agent. We were told how to maintain our farms well in terms of weeding, pruning, spraying, doing good agricultural practice and in fact I listen to the advice I take the advice and my yield have increased. Ohine Buafo is one of the millions of cocoa farmers who benefit from the free distribution of improved cocoa seedlings for the cocoa life program. The program which began 10 years ago has benefited communities in the various cocoa districts including New Jabin, West Achim, Suhum and Fantiakwa in the eastern region, Amansia West in the Ashanti region, Wasa East in the western region, and Isunafu North in the Bunahafu region. Tree Global, an international nursery service which provides high performance seedlings to large scale projects focused on agriculture, is being partnered to produce quality and innovative seedlings to farmers that ensure high yields in the cocoa life communities where Mondelez operates. The seedlings are nest in plastic pots designed to protect the top roots of the seedling instead of the usual polythene to boost production. It has a maturity period of 18 months as compared to the hybrid Tete Kwashi seedlings which has over four years maturity period. The seed from the same garden, seed garden from Cocoa Boat Seed Gardens, so it's the same genetic material. It's only the good condition that we are given from the beginning of the development of the seedlings. However, the nursery needs support for expansion. Demand for the nurseries far outstrips supply. What we have been asked by Mondalis to produce currently is just 565,000 seedlings, which we have distributed already. And the farmers are still in need of more. They have been coming here day in, day out. We can only expand our capacity based on what uh, the company that we are working with. Tree Global is open for partnership from government and individuals in order to increase production capacity and subsequently annual national production of cocoa. We have a capacity to produce at least one million seedlings. We can produce more than that. It will be good if the authorities concerned partner Tree Global to establish 
nurseries in almost all cocoa growing areas, if not all, in Ghana, because our technology is very, very good. That is the only way out. The country lead of Mondless International Cocoa Live, Yapepra Amekuji, is optimistic Ghana's one million target can be reached if such programs will be given the needed assistance. We should be able to have similar um, facilities in the western regions, especially western north. We should have one in the Volta region, we should have one in Ashanti region, and one in Brongahafu. That's why I'm saying that my vision is to see five of such facilities across Ghana. Let's turn our attention away from agriculture now as residents of Anlo Beach in the western region are yet to receive support after tidal waves washed away their property. Meanwhile, plans by the Shamar District Assembly to relocate them have stalled. Anlo Beach is a fishing community between the Pra River and the sea. Recent tidal wave attacks have destroyed property running into thousands of cities. 198 houses along the shores of Anglo Beach were washed away, leaving 838 residents displaced. Residents who conduct business at Shama now have to make a detour due to the washing away of an island which linked them to Shama. The assembly member of the area, Samuel Bolu, described the situation as unfortunate. The district chief executive for Shama, Joseph Amwa, said the assembly will do its best to ensure affected residents are relocated. We have a, a resettlement plan dating back to the 80s and we believe it's time we implement it. We have a land that we need to properly acquire and also prepare for the resident to move. A delegation from the Shama District Assembly has assessed the magnitude of the situation. President Ekufado has charged the Governing Council of the University of Education, Winneba, to immediately settle all disputes to enhance smooth running of the institute. Speaking at the 21st Second Session Congregation of the University, the President assured teachers of better conditions of service. In all, a total of 10,587 students graduated at various levels. Out of the total, 6,644 were from the southern sector, with some 3,943 from the northern sector of the country. Acting Vice Chancellor of the University, Reverend Father Professor Afo Bruni, said the university remains committed to churning out quality teachers. Your abilities, your competences, your selflessness, and your passion, as well as the unique knowledge and skills acquired over the years are meant to position you to more effectively and efficiently discharge your professional obligation to the set standards in the teaching profession. President Ikufuado reiterated government resolve to ensure teachers are treated with dignity and respect. We cannot value education for our children and yet disrespect the teachers who teach them. I'm committed to ensuring the teachers get better pay, better working conditions, a more secure retirement, and the respect of their fellow citizens. The president charged authorities to settle all grievances. Let us not through our utterances, actions, and inactions undermine the authority of our courts. And by this, urging the newly constituted governing council to do all within its power to see to an amicable settlement of all matters currently pending before the Winneba High Court. In the same vein, the chairperson of the governing council must urgently ensure that the council puts in place measures to seal all loopholes of waste and the abuse of public funds. 904 graduates received postgraduate degrees, 6,008 had graduate degrees, and 3,675 received diplomas in diverse fields. President Ekufuado wants cooperation from the chiefs and people of Adar to enable governments develop the salt industry in the area to enhance livelihoods. The president made the appeal when the Adar Traditional Council called on him at the Flagstaff House in Accra. 
The visit was to officially congratulate the president for his victory in the 2016 election and formally invite him to the annual Asafotu Fiyami Festival. The spokesperson for the traditional council, Nene Sogbojo, wants the area considered for the One District, One Factory initiative. President Kufuado called for support to improve resources in the area. We have a chance now to set down and find a way to develop the resource, satisfy you, the landowners, and then satisfy the development and bring some employment and prosperity to the general area. And I'm counting on the support from you, chiefs, the people who are in control of the land. And now, a new fecal treatment plant at Lavender Hill is expected to begin operations soon to complement the Mudo fecal treatment plant. Assistant Secretary at Old Lavender Hill, Emmanuel Vanderpoel, says although the plant has gone through a test run, he is unsure when operations will officially begin. The disposal of fecal matter at Lavender Hill directly into the sea over the years remained a health threat to residents living in and around the area. It has negatively impacted the environment, general hygiene and marine life. This led to the establishment of the Mudo Fecal Treatment Plant. Another fecal treatment plant is also being constructed at the old site where fecal matter was initially deposited into the sea. Assistant Secretary at the Lavender Hill Union, Emmanuel Van der Poy, said the facility by the Accra Metropolitan Assembly is expected to supplement the Mudo Fecal Treatment Plant. The two all belongs to AME. The first day they want to try it and we have some cars, they went there. Uh, after that cars went there, uh, we, mean, we knew that it was free. They are not working, they are testing it so they are not starting anything. He was, however, unsure when operations will officially begin. Meanwhile, dumping of fecal waste at Lavender Hill has completely halted. These tracks were seen dislodging sand residue accumulated in the tracks on the banks of the Coligono Sea. But residents and pedestrians in and around Coligono say they are now able to breathe fresh air without regular smell of feces. Sentinel and the yes more. The stench was too much for us to bear. Drivers who plied these routes complained severally. It is better now since the plant was established. A resident, Doris Marfo, explained how the stench impacted on the people living in the area. The smell becomes severe during the Hamatan season. Most of us developed respiratory illness because of it. The founding president and CEO of Imani Africa, Franklin Kujo, says the happenings at the Electoral Commission is a reflection of the state of the public sector of the country. He made the statement on TV3's current affairs program, Hot Issues. As one of the watchers of our democracy uh, from afar, we have always had cause to complain about the, about the, the challenges that the public sector really has. Um, we believe at Imani that one of the greatest banes of this country is the fact that uh, people in officialdom always take it for granted that their positions uh, are, are, are actually come with all the kinds of uh, laxity that we have as well. And I, and I found that very uh, shocking, that people were shocked that these things were happening at the Electoral Commission. The deeper issues related to you know, responsibility and accountability in office, unfortunately, have become anathema to the current or the, for a while now, uh, anyone who has been in office. And mm. these things permeate most of our public institutions. So I wasn't entirely surprised at all. If she could make an allegation that some of her deputies, especially the deputy in charge of operations, could actually transfer votes illegally, uh, tells me that during the election, process when we were having all these challenges the lady the poor lady was actually trying to keep together a commission whose leadership were trying to undermine her authority I'm, I'm reliably aware that she had actually prepared a dossier already that she sent to the presidency 
So she actually took lead. And I'm and that sure. That was earlier in the year. Well, earlier in the year. And I'm sure that um, all those people who have been cited are now coming to the realization that, wow, this woman had actually documented all these processes and actually taken the lead already. And, uh, and so now that they've heard, they are also actually making a lot of, you know, it's like a revolution, really. Everything we are seeing was actually one lady or one woman who had stomached a lot of nonsense by her deputies. And to the extent that, that she managed to pull the elections itself, it's actually some feather in her cap, I would say. And I'm saying to you that my reading tells me clearly that this woman was fighting sharks, a lot of them, human sharks, huge ones. Well, let's see what we have to fight in the real weather world. The night is expected to be cool throughout the country with scattered cases of thunderstorm and rains expected over the middle sector tonight. Isolated thunderstorms with rains expected over the upper west region this night. The northern region and the coast have a slight chance of thunderstorm and rain respectively tonight. Well, and the reports will say there would be mist and fog patches early tomorrow morning over areas with forests and mountains and the coastal belt. The report is up next. Still live here on News 360 from the News Hub at Odessa Weekend. Let's take a look at what's still ahead tonight. Farmers in the northern region reject government's claim of defeating four army worm invasion in the country. And on the international front, unidentified gunmen attack rural home of Kenya's deputy president, William Ruto, near the western city of Eldoret. Well, we've got the details of these stories for you, plus the latest from the world of sports and entertainment here on News 360. Stay with us. And hello again. Contrary to the food and agriculture ministers claim that the fall army worm has been defeated. Farmers in the northern region say the worms have rather multiplied. The farmers are the farmers are claiming that government is downplaying the threats posed by the fall army worm. On Thursday, the Food and Agriculture Minister, Dr. Ifriya Kutu, told Parliament the fall army worm had been defeated. The fall army worm invasion has been defeated by my government. But contrary to that, farmers in the northern region are saying the worms have actually multiplied ahead of the new planting season. Apart from battling climate change, farmers are battling the fall army worm invasion of their farms. The hungry pests arrived in the country last year during the harvesting of crops by farmers. Farmers say they have sprayed their farms several times with the recommended chemicals, but the worms keep multiplying. They are employing new tactics in fighting the pest using other substances like pepper, salt, washing powder, and herbs to fight the fall armyworm. Farmers say they are yet to benefit from 
the government's free chemical distribution. Mm. They want the Food and Agric Minister to turn his attention to eliminating the pest in the northern region. Well, let's look away from agriculture. They give out nothing but winning numbers, yet they're not rich. 62-year-old Loto doctor Moro Adamu says he has nothing to live on for his 30 years of experience as a Loto doctor. Here's Odilia Adjamain Prempe's report. It is 7 a.m. on Wednesday. Business has just started. But while some are seriously working out for winning numbers, others are still asleep. I was told those sleeping had been working all night to scoop out some numbers for patrons. Moro Adamu is popularly known as Nima. He has 37 years of loto forecasting experience. Though he's made several people rich, he is not. The reason is simple. He does not take part in trying his luck on lottery. This is simply amazing. Giving out winning numbers and yet refusing to also try one's luck. Adamu cannot boast of any property from his loto forecasting trade. He says the business only allows one food for the stomach. I haven't earned anything from this job. Perhaps he is lucky. The burden of taking care of his five children is on his wife. He confessed he does not make enough money to save. If I have money, I will stake immediately I work out winning numbers. Moro is not in this situation alone. Some of his colleagues also lamented the lack of government attention towards loto forecasters, although they play key roles in the development of the National Lottery Authority. This is what I do to take care of my family. Government should support us. We play a key role in the National Lottery Authority. People stick as a result of the numbers we gave. They claim the profession offers employment for many. Hundreds of them ply their trade along the areas around the National Lottery Authority and other places across the country. The tools, knowledge and skills for this are not difficult to access. The Director General of the National Lottery Authority, Kofi Osei Amel, however said, Loto forecasters or doctors are not licensed and will be arrested soon. They cannot be doing this work with impunity and just going taking money from Ghanaians without uh, the law backing them. So if they don't do it, it means they have decided that they are going to break the law. They are lawbreakers. He asked loto forecasters who want to work with the authority to make the request and stop perpetuating illegalities. The law prohibits uh, illegal loto operators or private loto operators. It, they, it, it doesn't give them any room to operate. We have given them the opportunity to regularize amnesty, to continue to do their business provided they pay the set out fees for government. The lottery business has many people at various levels of the process. There are vendors who sell official coupons of the National Lottery Authority referred to as loto writers. Emmanuel Ni Ajri is a loto writer. He started at age 18 and has been in this since 1974.
Though Loto Writing employs many, vendors claim what they earn is meager. He said they get 18% of what they sell, which he argues is inadequate. All the problems started 2011 when ma the management decided to deduct our commission. They took this decision telling us that they are going to import more pills, I mean the machines that we, we import. But then look, if you take our money and you are going to bring in more machines, is it for us or is it for management? The National Loto Act 722 was set up to raise revenue for government while offering employment to many. But I ask, will the Loto doctor ever be rich? Only time will tell. Right, the Universal Merchant Bank, UMB, one of Ghana's leading indigenous banks, has held a celebration gala night to mark its uh, 45th anniversary in Accra. Speaking at the event, the CEO of the UMB, John Ewa, said the bank will deepen its relationship with its customers and offer cutting-edge banking solutions as it looks forward to more years of excellence. The Universal Merchants Bank, formerly called Merchants Bank Ghana Limited, opened its doors to the public on March 15, 1972, as the premier merchants bank in Ghana. In its over four decades of existence, the bank has accomplished many noteworthy feats, including handling the share issues of eight out of ten companies when there was no stock exchange in Ghana in the 1970s. The initiation of the preparatory work in the establishment of the Ghana Stock Exchange, the arrangement and formation of the mortgage company currently known as HFC Bank Limited, and the merger of Ashanti Goldfields and Anglo Gold. In 2005, the bank introduced retail banking with the acquisition of a universal banking license. Currently, the bank has 31 branches nationwide and two UMB centers for businesses one UMB PPP incubator center and a vast network of ATMs. The bank is recognized for its entrepreneurial approach, innovative use of technology and distinctive banking solutions. Its 45th anniversary celebration dinner gala was attended by the creme de la creme of Ghana's banking industry with former President Rawlings as the special guest of honor. Seven. Speaking at the event, the CEO of the bank, John Iwa, said, Through the bank's 45 years, it has always pursued innovation, exceptional banking products, and a commitment to providing customers with the very best. Our objective was to help our economic growth through helping all categories of businesses. Through our assistance, many businesses were able to receive that crucial and vital capital to begin their operations. In many instances, we supported these businesses solely because we believed in their dreams and we believed in what they could contribute to the fabric and economic development of Ghana. Board Chair of the Bank, Elizabeth Zomelo, said the bank is committed to supporting SMEs and the socioeconomic development of the country. Many top companies in Ghana at one time or another had a relationship with our bank. As UMB provided the necessary financing and banking support to help them grow into what they are today. We're still live here on News 360. Let's now get into what's happening in sports as Theory Nan joins us in studio. Theory, what's to expect? In the world of sports this evening. Thank you, Natalie, and good evening. Well, Andre Ayu is staying. Other Ghanaians are moving around to bring you that and some other sports right now. 
West Ham United may have signed a number of players this summer, but Andrea Yu is overlooking a fight for starting position under Slavin Bilic. What then is he looking out for? Andre ended the 2016-2017 in a fine form, scoring five goals in 13 appearances. He made after uh, returning after the African Cup of Nations in mid-February and now wants more goals at West Ham United. I've been working hard. Been long days in Austria. Now um, Germany is just the beginning, but you know there are a few games to come, and and we we're working hard here. You know, trying to get our fit, and you know, working together, trying to get to know each other. As usual, I think um, it's something which is very very important. You know, and for me especially, it's been a while since I haven't really had a real pre-season because every time you go into international games and stuff, so you always come a bit later. So to to start the pre-season with the squad, you know, it's quite good. I'm going. I think I'm going to have a month of pre-season before the, the Premiership starts. I think I'm quite happy to, to see um, players coming in, you know, good players coming in. I think uh, we, we have a, a good squad. Um, it's good to have now players coming in, now we have to do the job on the field. That's another thing altogether, so we shouldn't get sold in headed. I think um, good players, we had already good players in the squad. Now good players are also in the squad to add up, so um, that's that's really good, really important for a club like West Ham if we want to get to to um, another level. From Andrea Yu then, let's go straight to some other Ghana internationals. Spanish side Atletico Madrid have moved fast to slap a huge 20 million euro price tag on Thomas Partey, who is a target for Valencia. There has been talks that could demand um, to leave, that a player could demand to leave the club for um, a regular playing time. The Ghanaian enjoyed good game time in the second half of the season in different positions. However, Gabi, so and Koke are starting uh, in those positions in midfield. Now Atletico are looking to uh, cover themselves in glory by placing the price tag on him. Elsewhere, Wafa uh, goalkeeper Razak Abalora has joined a Tanzanian giant Azam FC on a three-year deal. He leaves the Ghana Premier League title chases after another impressive season. Abalora um, has recorded 12 clean sheets in 22 games this season for Wafa. He was a key member of the local Black Stars team preparing for next month's um, African uh, Cup of Nations um, Chan tournament against Burkina Faso. Now, Ghana's 2018 World Cup opponents, Uganda, have lost their head coach. Militin Micho Stradovic um, has accused the Federation of Uganda Football Association of breaking their contract with him um, after leaving his post as Crane's head coach. The Serbian coach tendered in his letter of termination to the FUFA um, through his agent on Friday night, citing non-payment as the reason behind his decision. Besides guiding Uganda to the 2017 African Cup of Nations, after a 38-year wait qualifying for the 2014 and 2016 African Cup of Nations Championships and winning the uh, 2015 Regional uh, Kasafa um, Senior Challenge Cup, Solojevic also oversaw 51 Uganda victories drawing 29 and losing just 11. They hope we bring an end to the sports bulletin right here on News 360. Thanks for joining me. And that's what I'm going to for this edition. Not to miss that opportunity to take a selfie with Sushi Kumar. I did, well, unfortunately. Yeah. I saw him and, <laughs> I, I mean, he was far away and I was in another room, but I saw him through the window. I was like, well. Right. But I missed the opportunity. And now yeah. finding out. That Can't wait. I'll be hanging around to see him the yeah, next time. <laughs> next time <laughs> would be great. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I am Easter Morning. And I am Natalie Fort. There's more news on our website, freenews.com. News at 10 tonight will simulcast on our sister station, 3FM 92.7. Have a wonderful weekend.